You are listening to A Scary State, and this week we're covering South Carolina. So, Mackenzie. Yes, Lauren. Let's get scary. Hello, everyone. As you hear, Mackenzie is on again, helping me out. I just can't stay away. She just can't stay away. That's what happens with this podcast. (laughs) I was hooked from the beginning. (laughs) So, I don't think we have any true crime updates. No. I don't think we have much to talk about beforehand. So, you want to jump into South Carolina? I would love to jump into South Carolina. South Carolina, nicknamed the Palmetto State, joined the Union on May 23rd, 1788, and it became the eighth state to join the Union. South Carolina got its name from King Charles I of England, who formed the English colony. Some weird laws. Uh, tattoos are legal now, but at one time, it was offensive to get a tattoo, so you and I You and I, be, yeah, they wouldn't be, be very, very happy. Offensive. <laughs> Uh, If you're coming up to a four-way or blind intersection and you are in a vehicle that is not horse-operated, you must stop 100 feet from that intersection and fire a firearm into the air in order to warn horse traffic. I feel like that would scare horses. Yeah. I don't think that would be a good idea. Helpful at all. (laughs) On Sunday, only light bulbs are allowed to be sold. (laughs) I guess it's good if your light goes out. I guess so. Uh, And if you go to a gas station and want to change your clothes, you must get permission first. Does that mean like in the bathroom? Probably. But I will say I've never changed clothes in a gas station bathroom. No. Yeah. Not unless there was some desperation behind that. (laughs) I mean, that would be weird, like going up to the man or woman behind the counter and being like, hi, can I use your bathroom to change my clothes? I mean, that's got to be one of those old laws that they made a while ago. Absolutely. Well, like with um, Delaware, I read the one where you're not allowed to change your clothes like in the bathroom. And there were signs in the bathroom that said that. Hmm. Like still today. It was very weird. Well, Virginia Virginia has a law where you can't tickle women, but yes, they'll do that. Yes, they do. I guess it's not one that's upheld. And horses are to wear pants at all times. Okay, question. If a horse wears pants, Mm -hmm. do they wear it underneath them on all four legs? Or do they wear it on their back too? Their back too. That's how I feel too. That's their butt. That's where you put pants is over your butt. We have to see what other people think as well with the pants situation. Because haven't you seen it online? Tweet the at question? us. Hashtag horse pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, because we do have a Twitter we now. We do have a Twitter now. Do you want to mention what it is real quick, Mackenzie? Um, if I can remember. It's a scary state pod. Oh, yes. So follow us on Twitter because we just made that. Yeah. And tweet at us whether you think uh, horses should wear pants on all four legs or just over the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, Johnston, South Carolina is the peach capital of the world, and this is also the only state that grows tea in the U.S. Oh. And since the census in 2000, an average of 161 people have moved to South Carolina every single day. Dang. My friend Grace just moved down to Charleston. Shout out, Grace. Oh, Charleston. So nice. Right? Uh, fun fact, Austria and South Carolina are about the same size and land mass. In 2014, South Carolina was ranked number 11 in the country for lost or stolen guns and firearms. Good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 45 reports were filed and 417 firearms were stolen. Good. This is really a fraction. That's really, really great. Hmm. Uh, There are over 27 documented haunted roads in South Carolina. And this state is where the first game of golf in the U.S. took place. Apparently, if you look at the Panthers logo, it is meant to mirror an upside down image of both of the Carolinas. Oh, that's cool. Now I gotta look that up because I don't feel like a Panther looks like either of those states. Well, it's not the full Panther. But isn't that their logo is the Panther? Yeah, but it's not like their logo is not a full Panther. It's like the head of a Panther. Right. And the head of a Panther does not look like those states. Kind of does. Let me see. If you like squint your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of, right? Like with the little mirror image, if you turn your head. I would have to see the and states yeah. and the panther, like, next to it. I don't see it. I'm not convinced. Well, if you look kind of like, no, no, I don't think so. Well, kind of. Carolina Panther State. Yeah, actually, it kind of does. It kind of does. I can see it if you really are thoughtful about it, that it works. Do you see what I mean? Like, if you look back and forth. Okay, I found an image that kind of makes it work, where they fit it into the state. Oh, okay. It looks like it has to be kind of flipped upside down. Well, yeah, a mirror image. And you have to move the head. 
Okay. So I think so it works. I think the head is supposed to be South Carolina, and then the neck part is supposed to be North Carolina, since North Carolina is flatter. Look at us figuring this out. So <laughs> smart. Geniuses. <laughs> um, so a wild story. Uh, something that happened in Blackville, South Carolina in 1915. Essie Dunbar, a 30-year-old woman, was declared dead by Dr. D.K. Briggs uh, after an apparent epilepsy attack. And the next morning, she was buried. But her sister, who lived in a neighboring town, wasn't able to make it in time for the burial, so she asked the minister if he wouldn't mind digging up the coffin so she could see her sister one last time. And the coffin was dug up, the screws were removed, the coffin lid was lifted, and Essie sat up from the coffin and (laughs) smiled at her sister. (laughs) She'd been buried alive! (laughs) Absolutely not. And she went on to live for another 47 years. Oh my god. That is why I want to be cremated, so I'm for <laughs> sure dead. That is terrifying. That's like my worst fear. There have been stories, I like read an article at work, where it was talking about people who have been buried alive, and it's like a common thing that has happened. Ever since I watched um, uh, Romeo and Juliet, like, oh. it was in high school, and it was like, it had Leonardo DiCaprio in it. Yes. But it was like the modern, it was like, they spoke in old English, so I still didn't understand anything yeah, they were saying. Yeah, I remember watching that. And, but they used guns instead right, of knives or and swords. when she was buried, and they thought that, or he thought, I don't know which one was buried first, but when they thought the person was dead, and then they killed themselves, I don't know, something triggered in my head, like, oh my god, <laughs> they're gonna think I'm dead, they're gonna bury me, and I'm still gonna be alive, but barely breathing, so that's why they think I'm dead. I'm still alive, but I'm barely breathing. And then I'm gonna wake up in the coffin yes and then i am gonna die because um yeah so yeah that's why i want to be cremated so that i'm definitely dead okay i mean even if you're alive when you go in you won't i, be I won't be coming out exactly so <laughs> <laughs> it's a genius idea it really is uh and south carolina has six known serial killers and charleston is known to be a rather creepy place we went there for lauren's bachelorette party yes we did for trip um and we went on a ghost tour around the city it was really fun it was okay. <laughs> I don't love creepy things. But will you go on another ghost tour with me? You don't have to answer now. We'll answer in the future. But they have some around this area. Fun. Um, It'll be fun. It will have a great time. Do you remember how much anxiety I had when we went on this one? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really want to do that to myself No, it'll again. be a lot of fun. It'll be a good time. There's some where you go and you tour different pubs. And at each pub you get a drink. I could do that. I think you could do that I one. I could do that one. That, that I could be convinced to do. Okay. So, Lauren, what are you talking about today? Okay. So, today, what I'm going to talk about is a creature that comes from... Go- what is it? Gully? Gulla? Gull- Gull- it's not... Damn it. Look it up again. This always happens, and I write down the pronunciation of it, too, next to the word. It does nothing for me. Hungry. We'll have chips and dip after. Did you not eat breakfast? And I... Oh, my gosh. I meant to tell you about this. So I have found in my grocery store that there are frozen little chicken minis, like the kind you can get from Chick-fil-A <gasps> breakfast. Oh. And it's like a little mini chicken patty with like on a little biscuit. They're frozen. You just pop it in the microwave for like a minute and a half. Oh my gosh. They're delicious. Like do they taste like they the normal ones? They taste so good. Oh my gosh. There's, uh, yeah. So. Oh, that sounds so good. I'm obsessed. And I unfortunately only had two left when oh, I went to go no. have breakfast. So I'm a little hungry. Well, we will have seven layer dip or six layer dip. I don't know which one Joe bought. Six or seven is fine. Both of them are good. Okay, hold on. Let me see how you pronounce this. Percival Pauly. You have to say it with the Australian Percival, accent. Like Percival. Like Percival. Yeah, like Percival. Percival Pauly. Okay. I'm People have called it Purcellville. Makes sense. I don't know how it's spelled, so I can tell you. P U R C E L L. Purcellville. When people spell things to me, I cannot picture the word when they give me the letters. Like, I just don't have that ability. That's how I can spell is I have to picture the word. I have to write it down. Like, when my kids ask me how to spell a word, I have to, like, imaginary write it because I can't spell out loud. Yeah, I know. It's just, I can't spell period. Yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> I remember I lost the spelling bee because my word was iguana. And I couldn't remember if it was two N's or one N. So I did two N's, which was wrong. So the person next to me said it with one N and they got to go to the next round. In eighth grade, when we were doing the spelling bee, I was terrified because I was going to get it because everyone kept fucking up the word Odyssey. Oh. And, you know, after a while, I figured out what letters they were messing (laughs) up. So I got it because so many people had messed it up. So many people got out. So it was like me and a couple other people. And I was like, absolutely not. Am I going to be in a spelling bee? Because yeah, no, I can't spell now. I could never spell in eighth grade. Uh -uh. And so I messed up the word hypothesis. 
on purpose. Oh, on purpose. I know how to spell hypothesis. Oh. But I didn't want to be in the spelling bee, so I messed <laughs> it up on purpose. Oh, and by the way, when I say kids, I don't have children. I am a teacher. Yes. So I have 28 children. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the kids. Those are the kids. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is a creature that comes from... Gully. Gulla. Gulla. <laughs> Gulla culture. Um, so first I wanted to talk about Gullah culture a little bit. Back in the 1500s, an important part of Charleston's commerce was agriculture, more particularly the harvesting of rice. Unfortunately... Oh my gosh, mine talks about the harvesting of rice. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a big trade there. It was. But unfortunately, the way that those in Charleston harvested rice was through the use of slaves in the slave trade. Yep, that's what mine touches on. <laughs> These enslaved individuals were imprisoned in large numbers, and with that came a cohesive culture, the Gullah culture. And along with this culture came a sort of Creole language. The Gala people and that language were also called Geechee. Um, today, they are descendants of those African slaves who, in the late 1500s, were brought to the Carolinas. They all currently reside in the South Carolina Sea Islands in the southern part of the state. Much of their culture has preserved their African linguistic and cultural heritage. All of this has been combined from various peoples. Not lineage? No. Okay. Linguistic. Like, okay. talking. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. From various peoples, but they also absorbed a lot of their influences from the region they are in now, and many of their beliefs stuck with them. One is that the Gullah have certain beliefs about hags and haunts, which are similar to African beliefs about witches, malevolent ancestors, and devils or forest spirits. Ooh. So going off of that belief is the big belief that the Gullah culture holds that a person has both a soul and a spirit. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So these two things both have different purposes, though. Oh, interesting. The soul is what leaves your body when you die, mm -hmm. and if that soul is good, it will ascend to heaven. But a good spirit will actually stay on Earth. Oh, interesting. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind so of So the like... soul goes, the spirit will stay. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It stays behind to watch the deceased family, both guiding and protecting them if that is needed. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I want to adopt that idea. I know. I really like that one. But of course, not all spirits are nice. Of course. The bad spirits are known as boo hags. Ooh. This belief and legend of the boo hag comes from the archetypal myth of the hag, usually a malevolent creature that takes on the form of an old woman and terrorizes people who are right at that in-between between being asleep and being awake. Okay. These people usually report seeing or feeling the hag during sleep paralysis, which oh, is that I state of in-between. Have I told you about Joe's paralysis story? Yes. Okay, so that we've realized was the hag. Have I talked about on the podcast? I don't remember. Okay, well, I'm just going to say it again. Go for it. So long story short, one night I come home after being out to dinner with some of my friends, and I crawl into bed, and Joe's already sleeping, and I feel like this really cold thing touched the middle of my forehead. So I was like, oh, it was definitely my fingers. So I touch all of my fingers on my forehead, and none of them were that cold. So Joe's, like, kind of freaking out next to me, and he finally wakes up, and he was like, oh, my God, I just had sleep paralysis. Like, I couldn't breathe. So we fall back asleep. He texts me the next morning. He's like, okay, let me tell you about my dream. So pretty much he had a dream that a black mist started at the bottom of our bed and worked its way up and stopped on his chest. Oh, my God. And then he couldn't breathe. And so he's trying to wake up, and he's trying to get my attention, but he can't because it's sleep paralysis. Right. And so that was the moment that I had the thing touch my head, which ended up waking Joe up. Oh, my God. So we looked it up, and it's the old hag, That's which is the one that wild. stops you from breathing. Yeah. So for those who don't know what sleep paralysis is, it is exactly what it sounds. So you're technically asleep, but your mind or dream is that you're awake. So you're unable to move your body, and from the outside looking in, you look like you're sleeping. So during this time, it's common for people to feel a malevolent being in the room with them. Ooh. Sometimes they're unable to breathe, like what happened with Joe, or they just watch the spirit move closer to them, still unable to move themselves. I thought you could also have sleep paralysis. Like, I think everyone, my mom said that like everyone experiences it. And so in your dreams, like what happens to me every time I dream? That's like actual, like, yes. Because I it's feel so like I'm It's so you don't walking... act out your dreams. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? I'm not sure because every dream I ever have, there's always a point when I'm when I'm trying to get somewhere. It's usually when I'm trying to get somewhere quickly. Mm -hmm. It feels like I'm walking through water. Oh, interesting. Like in my dream, I feel like I have to grab something to pull myself yeah. forward because it's so difficult to move. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I don't so know if that's the same thing. So typically, I think why this happens is in real life, your body will kind of go through a paralysis when you're sleeping so you don't act out your dreams. So if you're running in your dream, you don't get up in real life and run. Ah. So that's why your body kind of paralyzes you while you're sleeping. So the sleep paralysis is when your mind wakes up, but your body doesn't. Uh, okay. okay. So you feel like you're consciously aware of what's happening right. in your room or right. like around you, but your body can't move. Ooh, I don't like that. Yeah, no. 
And um, Wanda used to tell us about that a lot. Yeah, she used yeah. to get those a lot. Yeah, and yeah. I was always like, that sounds terrifying. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so the boo hag I'm going to talk about is believed to have been derived from this hag lore. Okay. The best way that a boo hag can be described is kind of like a vampire being an undead creature that feeds on living humans. Ooh, but like that. Yeah, but instead of feeding on a human's blood like a vampire, they feed on a human's energy. So they're able to use witchcraft in a way to manipulate people who they then steal energy from. Usually this energy stealing occurs when the person is sleeping. This act actually and usually causes the victim to be rendered helpless and induces a deep sleep that is dream-filled. Usually bad, scary, vivid dreams. Yeah. So what do these boohags look like? They are skinless, but bright red with bulging blue vines. Bulging blue vines? Veins. <laughs> veins you said that so confidently i know too. and i heard it and i was like damn <laughs> <laughs> obviously they would stand out among humans because gross so in order for them to blend in they will steal a living person's skin and they will wear it like an outfit so that they can move around in the world of the living without drawing any suspicion upon themselves once night falls they shed that skin revealing that skinless bright red body then go on a hunt for a human to ride so riding is what the boo hag does when they are stealing someone's energy. I'll get to that more in a bit. Ugh. Boo hags are typically women or in a woman form and will typically go after men, but sometimes they do go after women. These boo hags may either appear to be young and beautiful or old and ugly, and they are determined to get to you. They will make it through very small holes or openings. A very slightly opened window or even just a crack in the wall is enough for them to get in. Once they find their victim, they slink their way over to them, then sit on the victim's chest, stealing the breath that person breathes out, in essence, their energy. So like I said, the boo hag will ride their victim the entire night, and I know that sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the act of the boo hag sitting on their victim's chest and breathing in the person's breath. Um, they actually will do this for pretty much the entire night. And more often than not, the boo hag keeps their victim alive so that they can keep coming back to them and continue to feed on their energy. But there have been instances where their victims had died from exhaustion. Oh, wow. So right before dawn break, the boo hag sneaks away, picks up their skin, and just walks away. But if the boo hag isn't able to make it back to their skin before the sun rises, they will be legit destroyed. Like, that's the only way that the boo hag can die. I feel like I've seen, like, a TV show or something that... A Do you think maybe it was Hocus Pocus when the sun comes up? No. <laughs> No. Well, I was going to say, think Hocus Pocus when the sun comes up and they kind of poof. This Because, like, as you're telling me this, there's something very familiar about it. And so I feel like a TV show that I've watched. There's another one. Um, I can't remember what the, like, um, lore is for this one. But there's another creature that does the same thing but takes off their legs and goes and does no, stuff. And it's the same thing where they have to come skin. back. Huh. I feel like it's something very Doctor Who-ish. Could be. A know. lot of TV shows have things where there's, like, shapeshifters and yeah, stuff. Yeah, just because, like, the the story sounds familiar, but yeah. I don't know. And you have seen Hocus Pocus, correct? Yes, I've seen Hocus okay. Pocus. Okay. <laughs> it's not scary. Well, I don't know. You're scary. You used to think the scary movies were scary. I mean, I haven't watched them since then. I'm sure I'd be fine. Is that what we need to watch to, like, We can start with you? that. I think that would okay. be a good place to start. Okay. Yeah. There are some jump scares. Yeah, I know, but... It's like Comedic supposed to be, scares. yeah, it's supposed okay. to be funny. All right, that's how we'll start. And I'll be sitting next to you, so you're the one who's going to get hit when I jump. Exactly. If anyone has good recommendations for, like, starter scary movies to get Mackenzie into scary movies, let us know. Fun fact, the last scary movie I watched was Final Destination when I was uh, about 11 or 12. Shout out to my sister who made me watch it. <laughs> and we were on vacation. I didn't sleep the rest of the vacation. Mackenzie! Well, because I started to watch the second one, and there was a part where a door slammed shut. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, well, that guy's about to die. And so when we were, <laughs> my sister and I were in our room, we had the hall light on, bathroom light on, door was open. Of course. And I stared at the door for two hours, <laughs> waiting for it to close. I woke my dad up, made him watch Aquamarine with me to try to get the scary Oh my out. gosh. Didn't really work. Yeah, no. <laughs> So that was the last scary movie I watched. <laughs> that gives you an idea of how my imagination works. <laughs> we'll get you there. We'll get you there. So if you've ever woken up in the morning still completely exhausted or even out of breath, one explanation could be that the boo hag visited you in the middle of the night. Mm. So like me, I'm reading this and I'm starting to think that that's what my exhaustion could be. But it could also be what happened. Been the boo hagged. <laughs> boo hagged. <laughs> or what happened the other night. So 
I go to bed at like nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm going to be really good. I'm going to go to bed really early. Well, then at like 1150, our electricity goes out. And when it turns oh. back on, it makes this really loud clicking noise. Mm-hmm. So that went on and it woke me up. So I finally fell asleep a little after midnight. And then we had a thunderstorm. Oh, no. And my dog, Roy, absolutely hates them. So it took us over like 30, 45 minutes to fall back asleep. Mm. So I woke up in the morning and I was like, I hate working. So. That sounds not boo haggish that you just were woken well, up. Well, that's bunch. one. Okay. <laughs> but all the other, that's what one of the nights could have been. But all the other nights, I'm just so tired. I always like to say I like to get it. I go to sleep early so I can get a head start. Because I know I'm not going to sleep through the night. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. But there are a few warning signs that could be an indication that a boo hag is near. And I can say that I did not notice or experience any of these signs. Okay, that's so good. So maybe I'm just not good at sleeping. So first, the air will become very hot and damp. So like very gross humidity. Hmm. Second, the air will then start to smell and it smells like something is rotting. Mm. But good thing, there are some protections that we can use against these creatures. Okay, let me have them. Similarly to other <laughs> creatures in the Gullah culture, these creatures are repelled by the color indigo. So if you go Ooh. outside and paint all of the frames of your windows with this indigo blue, boo hags will not be able to make it through that window. Uh, fun fact, indigo is no longer part of Roji Biv. So is it Roji Biv? Yeah. Oh, I don't like that. It's just blue violet. Oh, well, yeah. that's sad. Um, if these boo hags try to go through a window that's painted blue or touch the blue, they will scream out in pain as the color causes them physical harm. Hmm. This is also a common color used to repel just in general. Interesting. So I talked about this a bit at the beginning of, I think it was our Georgia episode, that um, many people paint the ceilings of their porches with the blue to repel evil spirits. I like that. Yeah. And also like many spirits, salt works. But this way of protection may actually be quite difficult to do because if a hag gets salt on themselves, they won't be able to return to their skin. So once the sun comes up, they're destroyed. That's good, though. Yeah. Or if their skin is covered in salt, they will burn the moment they get into it. That's also good. But if you see the boo hag, it might be hard to just dump salt on them. I don't know how Hmm. easy that would be. So at my old place, my roommate had a salt gun. Oh my gosh! And so you would load it, and then it was you would yeah you would use it, and we would use it to kill bugs. You have to have good aim, though. Yes. So if you just got a salt gun. And that could work. Instead of, you know, some people sleep with a real gun under their pillow. You just sleep with, with the a salt, salt gun. gun so that if you see one, bam, shoot it. And it works with other spirits, too, because the show Supernatural, they would carry around salt guns and shoot creatures with it. See? Um, you can also just casually lay a loaded shotgun across the head of your bed because boo hags hate the smell of sulfur, the smell that comes from gunpowder. Hmm. Others have placed forks under their pillow for protection. But one, I don't know. It didn't really go into that. It was just one source that told me about forks, so I decided to throw it on in there. Okay. Another one of the easiest and most convenient ways to protect yourself from a boo hag is to keep a straw broom or any brush, like with a bunch of bristles, close by. Apparently, boo hags are compulsive and curious creatures. If they pass a broom, they have to count every last bristle on that broom or brush before passing. Oh my god. Usually, with enough bristles, by the time they finally finish counting, they don't have enough time to ride you before the sun comes up and before they have to get back to their skin. Strainers or salt shakers or any other thing that has a lot of holes also works because the boo hag will stop to count the holes. But be warned, some are fast counters, so you might want to keep a few brooms, brushes, or strainers near your bed. I can just imagine, like, walking into someone's room and seeing brooms and strainers, like, (laughs) all about, and then, like, different things of salt, like, all over the room. (laughs) I sufficiently freaked myself out the other night because, you know, that's what I do. I had come home late on Thursday from something, and as I'm driving, it's, like, super dark, creepy, sketchy back roads, and every time I would see a mailbox, it would make me jump. So I was already in that headspace. So I get home and I go into bed and I'm trying to fall asleep because Joe and Roy are already sleeping. And then I'm like, oh my God, the boo hag's going to come. And I'm like thinking, <laughs> where are all of our brooms and brushes? And it, <laughs> it was another world. Oh my God. Um, so what happens if you actually do wake up and see one of these boo hags on your chest sucking your energy away? Well, you, have some salt. you just need to let it happen oh. and you don't want to fight it. Because if you do try to fight it, it might just steal your skin and use that one instead. <gasps> so best to just let it do what it wants to do. Now, boo hags are under the same classification as the hat man, the old hag, and other sleep paralysis demons who one may experience during sleep paralysis, like I mentioned before. So she falls into that whole kind of thing. Hmm. I found a website called North Carolina Ghosts, and I know it says North Carolina, but it's about the boo hag (laughs) because it stretches from like some part of Florida up to like the bottom of North Carolina with a very big beginning and everything in South Carolina. Okay. So that's why I'm using this website. That's fair. 
So this is a story I found on the website, and this is like word for word the story. So once there were two men who had been friends all their lives. They married two beautiful women about the same time, and everything seemed fine. But one day, one of the men came to his friend and asked him, When you wake up at night, is your wife in bed with you? Sure she is, said his friend. Why do you ask? When I lie down in bed, my wife is with me, but when I wake up in the middle of the night, she's gone, but then come morning, she's back in bed. Man, said the friend, I think you married a boo hag. Now, they know this was serious. A boo hag is the kind of witch that can slip out of her skin and fly around at night and cause all kinds of trouble in the world. A boo hag can kill a man just by sucking all the blood from his body out through his nose. Out through his nose? <laughs> <laughs> They'll get on a man and ride him all night so he can't move and he can't breathe. A boo hag is not something you'd ever want to meet and sure, not something you'd ever want to be married to. So the man asked his friend what he should do. You gotta wait until she slips out of her skin in the middle of the night, and then you find that skin. Look under the stairs. That's where boo hags like to hide their skins. You take that skin and you pour salt and pepper all over it. Then she won't be able to get her skin back on. And so that night, the man went to his bed with his wife and pretended to sleep. About midnight, he felt her slip out of the bed beside him. He waited for her to get downstairs and then get out of bed, then quickly hid where he could see her. He saw his wife pull off all of her skin and roll it into a ball oh. and hide it under the stairs. She then flew right up the chimney, going out to cause trouble in the world. Well, that man didn't waste any time. He went and got that skin and salted it and peppered it real good, then rolled it back into a ball and hid it back under the stairs where he found it. Then he went back to bed and waited until early in the morning when he heard a noise of something coming down the chimney, and he heard his wife's voice speaking softly. Skin, skin, you know me. Skin, skin, this is me. But he knew that with all the salt and pepper, she couldn't get back into her skin. He waited and heard her and heard his wife speak again. Skin, skin, you know me. Skin, skin, this is me. And he knew that she was stuck without her skin. He heard her coming up the stairs and pretended to be asleep. He felt his wife crawl into bed with him and wrap herself up tight in the sheet. But he reached his hand over and could feel something warm and raw and rubbery in the bed <gasps> oh next to him. After that, he didn't need to pretend not to sleep. When the morning broke, the man got up and said to his wife, Time to get up. Time for breakfast. But she said, I ain't getting up. I'm sick. And lay there wrapped up tight in that sheet, not showing one inch of herself. The man said he'd go to the doctor, but she said the doctor cost too much money. So the man said he was going to go hoe the garden. The man went outside and hid under the window. Sure enough, he heard his wife come down the stairs and call out again, Skin, skin, you know me. Skin, skin, this is me. That was enough for this man. He went down to fetch the conjure man who knew what, who would know what to do. He told the conjure man his story, and the conjure man told him to go home and start a big barrel of pitch boiling, and he'd be by shortly. What's pitch boiling? I think like boiling water. Oh. Uh, so the man went home and built a fire in the garden and started a big barrel of pitch boiling on it. Maybe pitch is something. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Soon the conjure man walked up the road and the two of them went inside and went upstairs to where the woman was back in bed, all wrapped up tight in her sheet again. The conjure man said, what ails you, woman? <laughs> woman. <laughs> and she said there was nothing wrong, but the conjure man wasn't having none of that. He ripped the sheet right off of her and there she was, laying there all raw and bloody. Ew. Man, you done married a hag, said the conjure man. And they grabbed her and carried her out to the garden where they threw her in the big barrel of boiling pitch and burned the hag alive. What else could they do? So that is one of the stories about the boo hag. Huh. So a conjure man, though, is someone who is experienced and knowledgeable in the art of hoodoo. So they're good at dealing with hags and other supernatural entities. Makes sense. So another story about someone's encounter of one of the boo hags goes a little like this, and I kind of paraphrased it. Mm -hmm. So this guy's name is Bobby Hansen, and he was living in a small town. He was good at poker, but horrible with women. He wanted a bride, but was having trouble getting one. Soon enough, his father decided to step in and help Bobby find a woman. But soon enough, Bobby and his dad gave up on that thought. Well, as fate would have it, that very next day, Bobby's father met an old woman who worked in town. They got to talking, and eventually the father told this woman about his son and how he wanted a bride and all of the women troubles he had been experiencing. Well, wouldn't you know it? The woman's daughter was also looking for a husband. So it was what a winky dink Right? So it was decided that Bobby and this woman's daughter would meet together at the next dance. Dance night comes around, and Bobby is very excited but nervous. He knew that he had women issues and didn't know if he was ready to love another woman. He gets to the dance, meets the woman's daughter, and falls head over heels for her. The two had a wonderful night of dancing, talking, and cuddling. It came to Bobby's mind that night that this was the woman he wanted to marry. Good very, for Bobby. Very quick. They would visit a priest and get married. So apparently- this The next day? Yeah. Okay. So apparently this priest visits a local grocery store to like deliver his sermons because they didn't have churches. Oh, interesting. And that's how you can marry people. I don't know. In the a grocery store. Yeah. Many guess. 
The woman also wanted to get married, but not by the priest. She preferred to be married by the judge of Beaumont, and Bobby, being so excited about this marriage, agreed. The next evening... Suspicious. Right? The next evening, the two were wed. The two moved into a nice cottage and were ready to start their life together. That night, after a nice meal, Bobby's wife was rocking peacefully in a rocking chair while Bobby fell asleep. When Bobby woke in the morning, his wife wasn't next to him, but soon she crawled into bed, all hot, sweaty, and kind of grumpy. When Bobby asked her where she had been, she didn't answer and immediately fell asleep. This pattern continued on for every single night, but now Bobby's wife would come to bed angry, sweaty, and cranky. She wasn't getting her energy. Right? And she would go to sleep before Bobby could ask any questions regarding her night. After many nights of this, Bobby went to visit a conjure woman. She told him what to do. How does one think to go to a conjure person? I don't know. I guess if... I don't know. Like if I think the story, so I read this story in two different places, uh-huh. and I think he tried to go to a doctor at first, and the doctor was out of town, okay. so he went to a conjure woman. So she told him to do pretty much what the other man was told to do in the story, hide and everything, pretend to fall asleep, and when his wife left to follow her. So Bobby did this and saw his wife take off her skin, revealing red underneath with blue veins. <laughs> <laughs> she then flew out of the window into the night. Frightened, Bobby immediately ran back to the conjure woman's house. She told him what we all know, that he had married a boo hag. She said that boo hags are witches and shapeshifters. They lure men into their trap and then deliver these men to the boo daddy. The boo daddy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and when I heard boo daddy, it made me immediately think of um, the princess and the frog. Like, you know, the evil guy? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. I guess like the bone daddy. That's what I thought of. The- Boo daddy, oh my yes. god. So the boo daddy eats the flesh and bones of these men. She told Bobby that this was his fate unless he was able to get rid of his boo hag wife. Bobby did what we talked about. He painted all of the windows with indigo blue except one window and covered the skin of his wife with salt and pepper. That night, when his wife returned to the house, she tried to get into the one of the windows and she howled out in pain. The indigo blue on the windows had burned her. Eventually, she found the one window that Bobby intentionally didn't paint. She flew in and straight to her skin as it was almost daybreak. Right as she put the skin on, she began howling in pain again. The salt was burning her from the inside out. Mm. In extreme pain, the boo hag flew out of the window trying to rip the skin off of herself. But being exposed to the light and not fully clothed in the, clothed in the skin, the boo hag exploded into thousands of pieces. Mm. Yet again, this left Bobby without a wife. Poor Bobby. <laughs> but it ended happy for him. The bachelor life agreed with him. He stopped looking for a wife and focused on what he was good at, which was poker. He made tons of money and was forever being chased by women. Wow. Look at that. So I'll leave you with one last thing. Okay. In Gullah culture, the common nighttime saying rather than good night is, don't let the hag ride you. Ah, there you go. Yeah, so that is the boo hag. Very interesting. So what are you telling us, Mackenzie? I am telling you about a haunted island. Oh. So I'm talking about Polly's Island. Okay. Which is a haunted island. The whole island's haunted. So I have three different parts of the island that are haunted. Oh, okay. Two are kind of tied in together. Okay. Um, And then the third is separate. I'm going to start off with uh, some history about the island. All right, so some history about the island. The island was first settled by Percival Pauly around 1711. The island is a thin strip of land between the Atlantic Ocean and the Waccama River. Mm. I hope I said that right. The island is known as one of the first to have seaside resorts on the East Coast. Oh. Mm -hmm. And plantation owners wanted to escape the intense heat and humidity, so they went to the seaside for their vacations. So the rice plantations you were talking about earlier, all these people went to this island. Okay. Uh, most of the plantations were in Georgetown, which is on the other side of the Waccamaw River. Uh, by the late 1800s and early 1900s, a lot of plantation land was sold to timber companies and rich northerners. The Atlantic Coast Lumber Company bought land to build houses for their employees to vacation in. One of these homes was the Weston House, which is now the Haunted Pelican Inn. Generations of families have been vacationing in the historic town. The island is only about three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide, and the year-round population is barely over 100 people. See, I want to live in, like, a sleepy beach town. But during the resort, like, the tourist season, it's way more well, populated. yeah. Yeah, but I'd be okay with that. They actually have a lot of nice resorts there. When I was doing my research, there was a lot of really fancy places you oh. could go. So for a small island, they had a lot you could do. Vacation ideas? I'm down. <laughs> um... I will be talking about a few of the haunted people and places on the island. Uh, Most of them are tied together in some way, and I will be talking about the legend of the Gray Man, the Haunted Pelican Inn, and Alice Flegg in the All Saints Episcopal... Episcopal... (laughs) 
and the All Saints Episcopal Graveyard. There were a couple of other haunted places, but it got very overwhelming to look at all of them, <laughs> so I just stuck with these ones. So a very haunted island. Yes. Um, and these are local favorites. And the Gray Man, some of the stories I have of people seeing him are not just from this island. Like, people have seen him all up and down the coast of South Carolina. I read about him when I was doing my research, yeah. and I was trying to find something to talk about. I saw him, and I was like, this is not long enough to do a whole part on. Well, I found three stories about him. Oh. <laughs> well, and that's also why I did three different haunted Oh, yeah. No, people. I'm excited to yeah. hear all about it. So I'm going to start with the uh, gray man. A lot of what I got was from excerpts from Georgetown, Ghosts of Georgetown by Emily Hunts, Hunsinger. Um, and then this guy, James W. Smith, has a website for vacation rentals, and he has all of these stories about the gray man. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So a couple of the stories are pretty well known. Like as I was doing my research, um, a lot of the sources had the same story as a couple of these. And then there's a third one that didn't seem to be quite as well known. Okay. So I'm just going to cover all of them. Nice. You know, we love the not well known things. Yes. So September 21st, 1989, Jim and Clara Moore took a walk on the beach. The sheriff's department said to evacuate the island because of Hurricane Hugo approaching. So walking on the beach is what you should do when the island's being evacuated. Exactly. Yes. Just before Jim and Clara saw, say they saw a gray figure. It was there one minute, gone the next, and they were not sure if it was the gray man, but they heeded his warning and left the island immediately. Oh, so does he, like, give you a warning? So the idea is, is that he, when he appears, he usually appears before a really bad storm. Oh. And so if you see him, you're supposed to skedaddle. Oh, how cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, how thoughtful of him. There are many other stories like these that date back hundreds of years. The gray man is a man who appears to be dressed in mid-19th century clothing, entirely gray. Obviously. Yes. There are always uh, sightings of the gray man before storms or hurricanes, and there are a number of different legends as to who the gray man really is. So that's the the stories I'm going to cover. Two, like I said, are well known. Uh, the third one was only kind of mentioned on one site. Okay. Uh, however, the third legend somewhat ties into the ghostly sightings at the Pelican Inn. Oh. So the Pelican Inn and the gray man are kind of tied together. Oh, interesting. So... And I'll go into that. <laughs> um, but what is really sweet about all these is that they're all some sort of a love story. Oh. Yeah. So that's kind of what I liked about all the things that I read for these different hauntings and ghosts is that they all kind of had to do with different love stories mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Oh. So sweet. <laughs> so legend number one. A young sailor who had been at sea for many months was finally able to return home to his fiance. The man was so eager to see his wife-to-be, he tried to cut through a marsh marsh just outside the island. The man and his horse got stuck in the mud. Oh. Is that where that saying comes from? What saying? Like, you're stuck, stick in the mud, stuck in, like, you can't move in the stick in the mud. It sounds good. Okay. We can go with it, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one source did say quicksand, but I don't know if quicksand is actually a thing. Okay, because <laughs> remember growing up, you always hear like, you always hear you're going to die in yeah. quicksand. Yeah, uh, I think you can make quicksand. Like there's certain beaches that I've seen on like, you know, YouTube or whatever, where if you start stepping really quickly, it turns into quicksand. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think it's as common as we were thought to believe when we were growing up. Yeah. So I'm just going to say mud. He was stuck in mud. Okay. Mud sounds good. Uh, and because the mud was so thick, it trapped the man and pulled him below the surface, killing him. Maybe it is quicksand. Quick mud? Sure. <laughs> There's this really funny thing we watched in psychology, and it was like going through the stages of grief. And so it was a giraffe getting stuck in quicksand. And so as he's going down, it's going through all the stages of grief. And then the last one is acceptance. And he's like, all right, I accept that I'm going to die. And then he reaches the bottom and just his head's out. So his whole body's stuck in the quicksand except his head. Oh, my it's God. So funny. <laughs> Uh, the woman was heartbroken by the news of her lover's death, and she began to take regular walks on the beach to clear her mind. On one of her walks, she came across a figure standing in her path, and the man was dressed in familiar clothes, and upon closer examination, the woman recognized the man as her lost love. The man warned her that she must leave the island at once because there was a storm approaching. Then the man was gone. The woman rushed home to her family and told them about what she saw. The family gathered all their belongings, headed back to their inland home. The next day, a terrible hurricane hit the island, and it destroyed almost all the homes on the island. 
all of them except for hers. Aww. So the legend goes that those who listen to the gray man's warning will return to find their home and property untouched by the storm. Aww. Mm -hmm. But what if he doesn't warn you? Then you're just going to leave and have your house be ruined? Well, they say if you see him and you don't go, oh. then that's what's, yeah. Oh, sweet. So. Sorry for that noise outside. Our neighbor is annoying. I hate obnoxious cars. And he sometimes will come home at 9, like 9 p.m., mm -hmm. and just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, legend number two. Uh, some say that the Gray Man is actually the original owner of the Pelican Inn, which is one of the haunted places uh, that you can you can actually stay there still. Oh. Mm -hmm. Plowden Charles G Gineret Weston. Yes. We're just going to call him Plowden for the rest of the time. Okay. <laughs> He's <laughs> part of his name. <laughs> uh, Plowden was born in 1819 and was part of a wealthy Georgetown uh, rice plantation family. Plowden went to England to study at Cambridge, where he fell in love with Emily Frances Esdale. The two were married in August of 1847, and they lived mostly on the Hagley Plantation. Soon after Emily and Plowden were married, they began making plans for their summer home on Polly Island. The two lovebirds spent the first decade of their marriage hopelessly in love, splitting their time between the homes. By the 1850s, tension started to rise between the North and the South. Plowden gave many speeches about the escalating confrontation. Plowden, however, always supported the South, since that's mm, where he's from. Mm -hmm. Right. As the Civil War began, Plowden moved away from the moved away from academics and became the company commander of the Georgetown Rifle Guard. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. Throughout the early parts of the war, Emily and Plowden entertained many of the Confederate soldiers at the Pelican Inn. By the end of the war, Plowden had contracted tuberculosis, Ugh. and he gave up his command to work in the office of the lieutenant governor. With his tuberculosis? Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, he spent his last moments with his loving wife, and he was buried in the churchyard of the All Saints Wakama Epic... This is going to be a tough one. The All Saints Wakama Episcopal Church. How many times fast can you say that? Not even <laughs> once. <laughs> they say that Plowden is the gray man because of his devoted love to his beach home, trying to warn neighbors of the risks of war and fighting for his homeland. And so now he roams the beaches warning uh, other residents of danger. Aw. Though we don't like him for his fighting with the South, but aw. True. Yes. Uh, and so this one um, is legend number three. Uh, and so this one is the one that's not quite as well known, but I don't know, it seems legit. Yeah. Um, especially because it's coming from one of the previous owners of the Pelican Inn. Oh, okay. And she was definitely an owner. I looked her up. Sounds trustworthy. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I felt it was legit. Yeah, definitely. After Plowden owned the Pelican Inn, it uh, changed hands and was sold to a lumber company. Remember how earlier I said lumber companies mm -hmm. bought up a lot of stuff? Yeah. Um, and that was up until about the Great Depression. It was then mm. sold in 1940 to Eileen Weaver, who is the one who renamed it to the Pelican Inn. Mm. That is a cute name for a hotel. Right, I thought so. Yeah. Especially on the beach. Yeah, exactly. Mrs. Weaver is where our third legend comes from. Mrs. Weaver first saw a spirit at the inn when she was in the kitchen making some bread. Mrs. Weaver was with her cook, and as the two women were preparing the dough, Mrs. Weaver turned around to see a woman standing behind her. The woman was fixated on the bread-making process. Mrs. Weaver said the woman had a disappointed look, as if oh. she was not approving of how they were making the bread. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, the woman was dressed in gingham-like material, patterned in gray and white, which is important to remember because that same style dress comes up later when I talk about the Pelican Inn. Okay. Noted. Yes. Uh, she had an apron tied around her waist and a pearl and pearl buttons down the front of her dress. Miss Weaver knew that the woman was not a living human. She's quoted to say, you knew the features were not earthly, but they were clear. Weaver recounted the woman's the woman's <laughs> the woman became a regular at the inn. Some guests say they saw her were walking up the stairs and some they and some did not even realize that she was a ghost when they first saw her. Oh, that's kind of freaky. Right? Uh, Mrs. Weaver's first encounter with the gray man happened as suddenly as her encounter with the woman. This man in the mid-19th century clothes appeared in front of Mrs. Weaver and soon became a regular in the inn along with the woman. So Mrs. Weaver's daughter told a story about one of the encounters that she had. During spring cleaning one year, my sister-in-law, Gail, was helping my mother get the inn in shape for the summer guests. Her job involved cleaning the upstairs bedroom and hallway. Mother always had magazines and books on long 
reading tables in the hallway for the enjoyment of the guests. Usually at the end of the season, all the magazines would be discarded, but some of the comic books remained, this time from the previous year. Gail reached to thumb through one, finding it interesting. She leaned back against the table. This apparently did not sit well with the ghosts of the house because a few minutes... Mon- Whoa. <laughs> My mouth kept moving. <laughs> <laughs> This apparently did not set well with one of the ghosts of the house because after a few moments, Gail felt a tug at her shirt tail. Thinking it was one of us teasing her, she ignored the tug and continued to read. Again, there was a tug at her shirt tail, and this time she turned around to see who it was. She realized that the wood floors made it impossible for anyone to sneak up on her without being heard. Whoever it was got the message across because Gail quickly laid the comic book back down and went back to work. It took (laughs) Gail some time to tell us the story, but we never doubted that it happened. (laughs) <laughs> so there you go i guess that's making you get back to work yep pretty much <laughs> <laughs> mrs weaver told about her experiences to a chronicler chronicler which i think is someone who like works on chronicles well yeah but it's <laughs> like of a, a town's history yeah yeah okay <laughs> mrs weaver told about her experiences to a chronicler of i'm not saying that right i know i'm not of georgetown's history He brought back a variety of 19th century photos and asked Mrs. Weaver to take a look at them. Mrs. Weaver identified the man and woman as Mr. and Mrs. Mazik, who were cousins of Plowden and Emily Weston. The Mazicks inherited the inn from Plowden when he died, and Mrs. Weaver believed that Mr. Mazik is the gray man. Uh, Talking about some sightings. Oh, yes. We love the sightings. Yes. And so what I had found is that a lot of people, um, when I was doing the research, like there was a lot of videos, not so much of people showing that they saw the gray man, but it was like people telling about these different legends and ghost things that you can do. Oh, cool. And then when you went to the comment section, people were sharing their stories and encounters that they had. And those videos didn't scare you? No, because it was just, like, a guy walking around on the beach during oh, the daytime. Oh, okay. So. Oh, during the daytime. I didn't really watch the video. I just scrolled oh. <laughs> to the comments. I was about to be very impressed. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, no. Well, and, like, those things aren't really that scary because you don't really see anything. Yeah, that's true. So I can watch those. Would you be able to watch, like, ghost adventures and things like that? Yeah, I used to watch it with my roommate. Oh, yeah. okay. Isn't that freaky? I'm not okay. there. Yeah, that's true. So I'm watching it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Good to know. There is a scary movie on the Alice Flegg. Uh, there is a movie made after her, like in her story, and it's like a scary movie. I'm not going to watch that one. <laughs> we'll get you there one day. Because remember, I used to hate scary movies like you, and then I expended my view and started to like them. Uh-huh. I know I left you behind. I'm sorry. You did. You did. <laughs> I'm all on my own. We'll get you there. We'll see. (laughs) So um, this one commenter said, I wasn't much of a believer of the paranormal until I saw the gray man for myself in Polly's Island when I was about 11 or 12. I didn't know the story beforehand, but we were staying at the campground and went to walk on the beach at night. I swear I saw a man in a straw hat waving at me from the edge of the water. I turned to my parents to see if they saw him too, but when I looked back, he was gone. There was a bad wind and thunderstorms that night, and most of the campsites had their things thrown about and broken, but ours was just fine the next morning, and our clothes were still on the line. When I told my aunt what happened later that year, she told me that the she told me about the story of the gray man, and I still get chills thinking about it. Ooh. Yes. Surprised, though, that their stuff didn't get ruined even though they stayed. You know? Because earlier you were saying, like, if people leave, the heat is warning. Oh, Yeah. Then their stuff doesn't get destroyed, but these people seem to stay, and their stuff still didn't get destroyed. Hmm. You know, I just realized that, too. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, uh, maybe he's like, you know, over time, he's like, you know what? These people need good yeah. things. Yeah. I'm not going to hurt them. So there's another one that I'm just going to read from the site because it's really long. Okay. But this is more towards, like, Myrtle Beach, which okay. I think is a little bit more – from when I was looking at the map, it seemed to be a little bit more north oh, okay. than where Polly's Island is. But it seems that the gray man kind of goes – Meanders around. Everywhere in South Carolina. They also – this um, site also said that there's uh, – supposedly that the gray man might be Blackbeard. Oh, but interesting. This was the only site that I – actually, there was one more site that I saw that might have said that too. So, oh, wow. And this one also mentions Mrs. Weaver thinking that it's Mr. Uh, Mazik. Okay. So who knows? Um, okay. So I got this story from this website, uh, Monster Vision TV. Okay. For nearly three decades, just outside of Myrtle Beach, Leo Martin has lived in a small, quaint little fishing inlet, spending the day and sometimes the evenings on the water. 
Mr. Martin recalls rather vividly an encounter with the infamous local legend. I had been out on my boat nearly the entire day as the sun was beginning to set. I was going to do one more sweep of the inlet for oysters when I noticed a man standing alone on the shore, said Leo Martin, Merle's inlet resident. With no other person around, no other boats, and nobody on the shore, the mysterious man really stood out to Mr. Martin. He then proceeded to steer his boat towards the shore in which this drab-looking man was standing on. At first, Leo believed this man was in some need of help, as he was waving his right arm directly in Mr. Martin's direction. So there was this man standing on shore by himself, waving to me. I thought maybe he needed help, but as my boat drew closer to him, I realized he wasn't waving at all. He had his hand out as if he was telling me to stop, said Mr. Martin. As Leo came closer to the shore, he started to notice the old gray clothing the man was wearing. Mr. Martin started to suspect that some shenanigans were afoot. As he realized, as he quickly realized, the man on shore was dressed in period clothing resembling a pirate. Oh. The closer my boat got to him, the more vivid he looked. He was dressed in all gray and looked like an old pirate. I honestly thought someone was just joking around, added Mr. Martin. Then the unspeakable happened. The man on shore vanished right before Mr. Martin's eyes. I couldn't believe what I saw. I literally rubbed my eyes and looked again. He was gone. I thought maybe the sun had taken its toll on me, having been on the inlet all day in the heat, said Leo. Disoriented from the strange experience, Mr. Martin turned his boat around and headed home. A few hours after he had witnessed this mysterious figure allegedly advising him to turn around, a severe tropical storm rose from the ocean and pounded Merle's inlet with extremely heavy rain, boisterous thunder, unnerving lightning, and glass-shattering winds. Man, this is directly from the site. <laughs> Leo was no stranger to the old ghost tale about the gray man. At the time I saw this man just disappear, the first thing I thought was about the gray man. Did I just see the gray man? A few hours later, a huge storm tears through, tears through here, and everything started to make sense. He was warning me to get off the water because he knew the storm was coming, added Mr. Martin. Did Mr. Martin witness the gray man so commonly known in this area? Only Mr. Martin knows for sure. His story certainly falls within the realm of many others before it. So it sounds like the gray man's like a nice guy, mm -hmm. you know, like warning you when there's going to be a storm. Yeah. So oh, that's very sweet. The famous one is the one I started off with at the beginning of that couple who yeah. saw him before the hurricane. Mm -hmm. um, I w had watched a, a video that had played a newsreel of some sort and they were talking about it. How there have always been sightings of the gray man, like before major hurricanes that have hit. That's actually really, really cool. Yeah. So he's a good guy. Yeah, apparently. So that's the gray man. Nice. And we now, like him. Yeah, I do like him too. So now we're on to the Pelican Inn, which kind of ties in with the gray man. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go back through the whole history of the Pelican Inn because I kind of already went over that when I was talking about the gray man. Mm -hmm. But the history of the Pelican Inn begins with our buddy Plowden. As it has changed hands over the years, there have been a variety of spirits that have roamed these halls. Of course, we have sightings of... Plowden. He is mostly seen inside of the inn in Civil War clothing. Along the beach outside of the inn is where most of the gray man sightings occur. Uh, people also claim to see Plowden's wife, Emily. And Emily's ghost usually leaves a lingering scent of perfume. That is a common thing among ghosts, apparently. Like, if you smell, like, a floral scent, it means that you've passed, like, by a ghost or that a ghost was recently there. Hmm. It's not with all, but it's some common thing that we've, like, when we were ghost hunting, that we would think of. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, and there are also two dog ghosts who haunt the halls. Oh, yeah. Aww. There are Boston Terriers of a previous owner. One of the dogs tried to save a boy who was drowning in the ocean, and the dog sadly did not survive. Oh, did the boy? Uh, I think so. We're going to say he did. Yeah. And the other dog died of loneliness. Oh. So you can hear their barks. Their barks have been heard in and around oh, the house. Oh, my heart. Yeah. Oh. So, so some of the sightings. Uh, this one is from Amelia Shaw. I grew up going to this island. We stayed in an older house, Port Arthur, next to one of the oldest. I am reading this verbatim from the comment. <laughs> okay. Uh, at the Pelican Inn, a friend and I would get glass Coke bottles and play on the joggling board and watch the fur furniture shift. And then at Alice's Grave, which is um, the lady I'm going to talk about next. Oh, okay. At Allison's Grave, it's seven times backwards. I saw someone only once when I was five or six tell me, go to your father. A huge strike of lightning hit the metal poles lining the gates, and I ran to my dad. The other dog story was very memorable. The other one was about the Civil War soldier who took refuge but had an accident falling down on a set of stairs, breaking his neck. Oh. In that house, people have tripped and been saved by what has been described as a set of hands pulling them back from falling. 
And the last and saddest by far, a slave who was brutally whipped and killed no matter how much the floors were scrubbed, the bloodstains would always come back. Ew. The wood was repurposed and used in building one of the shops in Polly's hammock buildings, and it's always been my favorite place to visit during summers. I love now as an adult to investigate. Interesting. So. Lots it of places like, on this island are spooky. And it seems like a lot of the ghosts here are, like, helpful. Like, yeah. Like, oh, I don't want you to fall. Um, oh, I'll give you a warning of a storm. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is from Gregory Johnson. Again, I'm just reading these quotes verbatim. Okay. Another awesome spooky upload. My favorite, though, I can relate to all since the southern coast is my stomping grounds during the nor'easter winters. So my favorite story has to be, without a doubt, Polly's Island. The dogs. We've seen the one and. The sighting lasted no more than a few seconds, but myself and other family members, we were searching for sand dollars during sunset, saw the dog. It faded away as it was running back and forth along the shore. Oh, Yeah. Living its best life. Yeah. So. Best afterlife. I thought that one was sweet. That one is sweet. And you can go to the Pelican Inn and stay there. And it they haven't really done many, like, reservations to kind of keep the historicalness of it. Mm-hmm. But I won't lie, when I was reading through it, it didn't have the best reviews. Oh, because I was going to say, we could go there. Yeah. And that, I didn't look too much into it, so it might have only just been the one or two that I saw. Yes. But you can't stay there. So. (laughs) And lastly, I'm going to talk about Alice Flagg. Alice's story is one of the heart wants what the heart wants. Alice grew up at the Hermitage Plantation in Merle's Inlet, just north of Polly's Island, Alice was expected to marry a well-to-do plantation man. However, when Alice was out one day, she met John Braddock. Braddock worked in the lumber business, and while he was successful in his field, he was still not—he was still considered of the lower class uh, compared to the Flag family. Mm-hmm. Alice's brother, who had become the head of house when their father died, and mother were against this newfound love. Alice continued to follow her heart, though, and the two would meet in secret. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. The two became secretly engaged, and because Alice did not want to get caught, she wore the ring on a necklace instead of her finger. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Once her brother and mother discovered this in secret engagement, they sent Alice away to a boarding school in Charleston. While away, Alice became very ill and returned to her home in Merle's Inlet. Now, this is where some of the story kind of starts to differ. Mm-hmm. So all the things that I saw was about what happened to the ring – because that plays into the haunting. Okay. So some say her brother saw the ring around her neck when he was caring for her, and he tore it off her neck and threw it into the marsh. Oh, that's mean. Mm-hmm. Some say that when Alice, is, Alice died, and her that's when her family found the ring as they were preparing her for burial, mm-hmm. and threw it into the marsh. Regardless of the story, it got thrown away. <laughs> <laughs> and Alice did not have her ring when she passed on. Aw. Yeah. The story says that she's buried in All Saints Cemetery. And that there is a tombstone with just the name Alice inscribed on it. But as I was continuing to do research, there are a few different Alices that that Alice could possibly be. Oh, okay. Some say that that one is just a ceremonial one. Um, and that this Alice, Alice Flag, is actually buried in the Balin Cemetery in Merle's Inlet, where her home is. Mm-hmm. And that's where people see more of her is in the plantation home. So the stone at All Saints with her name on it is said to be more of a memorial, and Alice mostly haunts the plantation home, but people say that they've se- that they have seen her at the gravesite on Polly's Island. People leave flowers and rings on the tombstone, and when I was looking, there was a bunch of pictures, and they were a bunch of rings on there. Oh, that's sweet. And they say that if you place a ring or ring-like object and walk around the grave backwards 13 times, I also saw six times clockwise and counterclockwise, I also saw three times... Who's to say how many so times? Something. Yeah. <laughs> An amount of times. An amount of times. Um, but Alice is supposed to show herself, and she is expressing gratitude for the return of her beloved ring. Oh, that's sweet. It's best if you visit the grave at night. As it always seems to be. Sure. And Alice has also been spotted at her home, haunting her bedroom, looking for her lost ring. So, poor Alice. Yeah, poor Alice. Yeah. So, these are some of the sight- er, stories that I found of sightings of Alice. So there was um, a video of a guy who went to her or went to that specific gravestone. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to kind of read what the video said. Okay. Um, We kept hearing heavy footsteps stalking us while we were there. Three different times we stated that someone else was on the lawn walking around with us, but we could never see anyone with us while while the flashlights were on. No animals were seen either. 
and you can hear someone talking in the video and the guy who posted it he posted like the um text of what was said it's you can kind of hear something mm-hmm. but it supposedly the voice said give me my ring back oh and then one of the comments under the video i went there because i live very close and i found a ring it was so pretty and i found it metal detecting i did a ritual and placed it on her grave then she came out looked at it and curtsied shook her head and went back in oh i saw the same comment on another video too so okay legit. yeah hopefully it's her ring so a couple of others this is from jackie champin Jackie and her friends went to visit Alice's grave. They had performed the ritual, and when nothing happened, her friend decided to jump on the tombstone and declared Alice as a fake. Oh, yes, yes. That's always good to do. Disrespect people. Mm -hmm. And Alice got back at them. (laughs) They all just laughed it off, but when they got back to their car, two tires were flat. There was no one else at the cemetery but their group, and Jackie was convinced that Alice is the one who slashed the tires. Yeah. So another one comes from the Chandler family. The Chandler family moved into Alice's home and recalls a time when they saw Alice. It was during World War II, and one of the Chandler sisters was outside on a hammock. She began to scream, and her brother Bill ran out to see what was wrong. When he got to his sister, she was pointing to a figure just floating there in front of them. Other family members have seen her floating around the house as well. So those are some of the haunted things that you can do on Polly's Island. Oh, yeah. very nice. There's also a plantation that was haunted that I was going to look into, but that was when I started to get overwhelmed. So. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yes. We could go and just pop around Polly's Island, we stay could. at the Pelican Inn if it has good reviews. We could visit the Pelican Inn. Because you wouldn't want to stay. No. See, I tell myself, like, oh, I'd love to stay at a haunted hotel, and I'm, like, really brave about it. But then I think the moment I get there, I'd be like, no. And then if anything happens, I'd be, like, extra scared. Because I've slept in one haunted house in my life, and it was very terrifying. See, I know myself well enough to know that I'm not brave to do that. What would you do if, hypothetically, we were hanging out, and we, like, got a hotel, And then we stayed there. And then the next day I told you it was haunted. I would never speak to you again. (laughs) Because you will have betrayed my trust. Okay. So what if – okay. I have have my thoughts. What if I like slip it into conversation real quick and you don't hear me say it but then you agree? Why would you do this to me? Because it could be fun. I don't think so. I think only one of us is going to have fun in this situation. But then we would have so many fun things to talk about. I don't think so. I think we would. Once you like scary movies. Okay, here's the thing. (laughs) You got the hand motions going and everything. Here's the thing. I will agree that I could maybe get on board with the scary movies. Okay. We'll start one step at a time. But I will never, ever, 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 ever go to a haunted house, go to a fake haunted house, a real haunted house, nothing haunted, nothing, 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 ever, 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 ever. Will I physically go to a location (sighs) that is haunted or where people might scare me? Because I don't like being startled. And because you're not allowed to punch the fake people, so you get kicked out immediately. I would probably pass out of fear. Okay. Because I'd be hyperventilating so badly. <laughs> um, I, it's so easy to startle me to the point where when people come into my classroom, they knock on the door first to make sure <laughs> that I am aware that someone is about to come in because I am always startled. So here, hear me out. You know how we started at the same level of scaredness, Mm -hmm. and then I advanced. I think I went down. (laughs) But see, we started at one point, and I was able to get here. So I know with enough movies and enough slow steps during spooky season, which is the best season ever, I am actually wearing my Let's Get Spooky sweater, we will get you to the same level as me. I don't think you have the same level of anxiety that I do. That is true. But (laughs) I think we can do it. We'll get there. I've already agreed to the scary movies. Yes, yes. I'm I, not going to push my luck. We'll do the scary movies. The more you push me, the more I'm going to say no. You know how stubborn <laughs> I, I am. Know. I'm not going to know. <laughs> okay, we'll start with the scary movies. Okay. And that's, we'll Deal. go from there. We'll go from there. All right, well, thank you for doing South Carolina with of me. Of course. And always for, happy to be a part of it. And for continuing to look at spooky things. I love reading about spooky things. Perfect. I just don't like watching them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you want to send us any emails about any scary situations or serial killers or anything, send it to a scary state podcast at gmail.com. We also have an Instagram and Facebook at a scary state podcast. And we just had amazing Mackenzie make us a Twitter. So that is a scary state pod um let us know about the horse thing oh yeah how you think horses wear pants yep 
and any scary movies Mackenzie can watch that are easing into scariness. Easing into scariness. All right, so stay scary, stay safe, and don't let the hag ride you.